exploration under the Stafford Act, which, as you know, we invoked previously, and which activated FEMA's National Response Coordination Center. FEMA now is fully engaged at the highest levels. Today, FEMA is activated in every region. We are at level one, level one being the highest level, which we will uh, work with. And we've been working with FEMA. I've done a lot of work with FEMA. They're incredible. Uh, it's always been on hurricanes or tornadoes. They're right now in Tennessee. A large group working in Tennessee have, have been incredible. That was a tragic event. Uh, Alabama last year, also a tornado. And then, obviously, the the numerous hurricanes in different locations that were, uh, in some cases, very devastating. And in every case, FEMA came through. Uh, this is a very different kind of a work for FEMA, but uh, they will come through, as they always do. We have tremendous people, tremendous talent in FEMA. We're sending, uh, upon request, the two hospital ships. They're being prepared right now. They're massive ships. They're the big white ships with the Red Cross on the sides. One is called the Mercy, and the other is called the Comfort. And uh, they are uh, in tip-top shape. They soon will be. They're getting ready to come up to New York. I spoke with Governor Cuomo about it. He's excited about it. And I also uh, — we haven't made the final determination as to where it's going to go on the West Coast. The Comfort is uh, located now uh, in San Diego. And it's going to be uh, — we'll be picking the destination fairly shortly. So uh, those two ships are being prepared to go, and they can be launched over the next week or so, depending on need. Uh, earlier this week, the first clinical trial of the vaccine candidate for the virus began in Washington State, as you probably know. The genetic sequence of the virus was first published in January. But thanks to the unprecedented partnership between the FDA, NIH, and the private sector, we've reached human trials for the vaccine uh, just eight weeks later. That's a record by many, many months. It used to take years to do this, and, and now we did it just in a very short while. That's the fastest development in history of what we're doing with regard to the vaccine. We're making very, very big progress. Today, I can announce further steps to expand testing capacity. We're working with several groups to determine if the self-swab, a much easier process than the current process that's uh, not very uh, nice to do, I can tell you, because I did it. Uh, but uh, we have a current process that's a little bit difficult. If you have it done, uh, the, uh, the groups are working on determining if a self-swab by an individual is as effective as the other. The other is very effective, very accurate. Uh, but uh, we're going to see if we can do a self-swab, which is uh, — would be a lot more popular, I can tell you that. So uh, — and that would be administered also by a health official, but it would be a lot easier to do. The uh, — the uh, fact is that the health professionals would — it would free — it would free up a lot. Let me just say, the self-swab is what it is. It's a self-swab. You do it yourself. The other has to be issued by a, a health professional, and it's something that uh, is is quite difficult. And we think it's working out for the self-swab. And uh, if it would test positive, the people would go, and uh, they would do what they have to do. But we think that's probably working out. I've asked the FDA to cut through the red tape and reduce regulatory barriers. Uh, we are looking at some very exciting things, and I'm going to be holding a second news conference either today. We're going to talk about the FDA. Uh, some things are happening that are quite exciting. Okay, so that was just one part of the update we got from the coronavirus task force from the White House just minutes ago. Now, if you remember yesterday, during the press conference they held yesterday, the stocks rallied during that press conference. They talked about the stimulus package, a very different situation that we're looking at now when you look at the stock market. If you can see, the Dow is down 8%, but trading has been halted. It was halted just about 11 minutes ago. This is for the fourth time this month. The S&P dropped 7%. So these are the breakers that they put into place to make sure they kind of slow down that momentum, give investors and everyone a chance to take a breath to just eliminate the chances that there'll be a big slide. 
So these breakers were set into place. Trading was halted. It will resume in just about three minutes. It was halted just before 10 o'clock this morning. So we will continue to keep an eye on the markets as the coronavirus has a very big impact on what we're seeing there. All right, we want to go now to Dr. Margaret Harris of the World Health Organization joining us live from Geneva. Thanks so much for joining us, doctor. So tell me a lot of the discussion that we're talking about this morning is in testing. There's been a lot of concern over who's getting tested, how many people are getting tested. Do you feel like we are getting a handle on this, that testing is becoming more available to the people who need it? This is really good news that you're really scaling up the testing because it's the fundamental of controlling this virus is to know who's got it. And the people you really want to be testing are everybody with a suspected case. That's everybody who's been clearly exposed to somebody else who's in, 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 infected. I, I know you know your president just describing how he was tested because he'd been in contact. Other people who've got symptoms, the, the dry cough, the fever, the breathlessness, those people you really want to test, but you also want to isolate them before you test them so that they are not, if they're infectious, before you know the result, you want to make sure you've removed them from exposure to other people. And you also want to identify all the people around them who could have been exposed to them and those people need to be isolated. So this is a big job. And this is what's often forgotten about what worked in China. We saw the big lockdowns and we saw you know, the empty streets. But what they also did was mobilize an army of people to really track who was possibly infected and make sure they were isolated. I know that's why they've credited Singapore with being able to shut things down and really within just a couple of hours figure that out. The question is now here in the United States, is it too late to do that? So many people have been walking around without knowing if maybe they were asymptomatic. I mean, I'm scared that even though I don't have any symptoms, I feel healthy, that who knows who I've been in contact, you know, in these prior weeks to know really where it is. And then you have these self swab tests that they're talking about. Can we be sure that even if those are, if, you know, efficient, if they're done properly, that we'll really get a good handle on all of this? So indeed, and it's absolutely natural to feel frightened, especially when we're seeing so many changes in so many societies. Our world seems to be going topsy-turvy, but take heart from the countries that have done it. So again, China, I don't think anybody, even, even we were amazed by what they achieved in such a short time. They're still under threat because they're seeing cases, most of their cases now are people who've come from outside. So it really shows us that we as a world, we are truly a global people. We are not one country, not America, not China, not UK. When we're fighting something like this, we, can, we do it together. So we keep using a word, word solidarity, but the solidarity is what will hold us together. When we were back in the caves, we used to huddle in our caves because we were frightened of what was outside in the dark. Now we can't huddle, we need to distance, but we can huddle on the internet, we can huddle through programs like yours, we can listen to each other and we can help each other. And I think now is the time we will see the best of each other. Are we doing enough though? You know, I mean, the World Health Organization had said it was alarmed by the inaction early on in this pandemic when it was declared a pandemic. Are you still concerned by inaction or do you feel like we are doing what we can as quickly as we can now? We think really the message has hit home. I, the struggle for many countries, especially in Europe and the Americas, you've really not experienced anything like this, honestly, for a hundred years. That's for, that's three generations ago. So I, I, I've worked, spent much of my working life in Africa. For people there, it's the norm. They actually are not surprised by an epidemic and they're very good at complying with what needs to be done very often because they're dealing with horrible things daily. So it is understandable that people in Europe and, Af and, and America were not quite ready to believe that this was a very serious situation. But what we're seeing this week, really, people do understand. They're ready, they understand that they're going to have to put up with some inconvenience for the greater good. And yep. 
truly, we do believe the greater you will see the good. Because we're looking at this globally, and you've mentioned Hong Kong and Singapore, most of the people I've talked to who are under shelter in place orders, whose schools have shut down, whose children are home, they're asking, okay, we're doing this now. Some people are in day two, some people in day one, some people anticipating that it's about to start across the country. They all want to know one thing. How long will we have to do this? And so what are you seeing from Hong Kong and Singapore and China, knowing that they handled it a little differently than we've been handling it here in the U.S. and they've been handling it in Europe and where this disease is now? How long do you think? Are we deep into summer? Are we 18 months out before life returns to normal? Everyone is trying to figure out how long they need to hang on. Well, we certainly realize that we're going to be in it for the long haul. We don't have a crystal ball, so we can't give you a date. I heard just in a press conference we had that some um, uh, preachers in Africa are actually putting down a date. No, 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 there is no date. Uh, we are in it for the long haul because, again, we are so globally connected. We do tend to reseed outbreaks, so we have to be really think about how, once we've got to the other side, how do we slowly resume activities without starting up the so, outbreak again? So, Dr. Harris, I guess that's the question. We don't know when it's going to fully end, but when would we get some of our lives back to normal, do you think, based on what we've seen in the countries who are ahead of this? You know, we know in California, the governor had said, expect to have schools closed for the rest of the year. In Kansas, they've already ordered the schools closed for the rest of the year. You know, and so people are trying to figure out by summer, will we have some semblance of normal while we're still washing our hands, while we're still exercising social distancing? Will children go back to school in the fall? Is there a point where, while we don't know where it's going to end, that we will get some, some relief? So you will see some relief as your curve begins to flatten. You will begin to make plans about how to resume activities. So really, it's like, I, I, I mean, I, I having said, I don't have a crystal ball, but we do have an epidemic curve. So once you see that the actions you've taken are beginning to have an effect, you will have a sense of how, that things will change. But I think it's very important for under, people to understand what is normal? We may not need to think about how we live our lives. We spend so much of our time so physically close together that a pathogen like this has had a very good chance of jumping into our population and spreading very effectively. So again, with things like schools, can we do more online? Can we do more teleworking? Do we really need to jam pack ourselves into transport, into planes and fly all over the place? So there needs to be a lot of discussion about what really is the norm. Is Are there new norms that might be better? And I think we are all having those discussions right now as we uh, face this new world and this new reality. Dr. Margaret Harris uh, from the World Health Organization joining us from Geneva. We appreciate your time and your insight. That's a pleasure. And if you are just joining us now, this is your daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong. We are going to be live streaming for you every day, every weekday at 10 p.m. or 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern time, providing the latest information on the coronavirus outbreak nationwide. We want to go now to Chicago and Sally Schultz. We talk about the vulnerable populations and protecting the people who are most at risk. And it's those seniors and nursing homes that really give us great concern, Sally. That is certainly the case. This nursing home right here behind me has become the focal point of the outbreak here in the Chicago area and the state of Illinois. Over the weekend, we learned that one patient here had tested positive for the virus that has now spiked to 22 positive cases at this nursing home. They're now checking residents every couple of hours looking for symptoms, knowing that the numbers here could very well increase. The Numbers, they could change every second, according to someone with the health department here in DuPage County, where I am. I just spoke with that person, say it's such a fluid situation. I want to give you an idea of where we are. This is the Chateau Nursing and Rehabilitation Center in Willowbrook. That is a suburb of Chicago. We're about 30 minutes southwest of Chicago. 
Health officials say they've got the cluster here contained with all the infected people in a separate wing and a couple at the hospital. It is 18 residents and four staff members who have tested positive here at this facility. Again, this is such a vulnerable population. We've heard from health officials over and over. You do not want the elderly getting this virus. And of course, in a long term care facility, that's not where they want to be having this. We've seen what happens with that nursing home outside of Seattle in Kirkland, Washington. So after the first person tested positive here. The state put on their biggest effort to date of testing more people. They brought in 200 testing kits to this facility over the weekend to see who else had it. Now, DuPage County Health Department says they were not surprised. They were preparing for this, even expecting this. And again, they say that it's very certain that the numbers here could rise. One of the big efforts they have underway right now is contacting all the people who have been in contact with those infected at this facility. That number could be more than 2,000 people who've had contact with the 22 infected patients here. Overall, in the state of Illinois, we've got 160 confirmed cases, 22 of them here. We've also had our first fatality because of COVID. COVID-19. It was a woman who's 61 years old in Chicago. Her family says they thought she was just having another asthma attack. Turned out to be coronavirus. The governor has been speaking daily at 2.30 in the afternoon central time. We're expecting another update from him today. I was told here in DuPage County that they cannot give any updates about the number of cases at this facility, that all that information has to come from the governor. Again, that's going to be happening this afternoon. And again, we are expecting the number of cases here in Illinois and possibly at this facility to go up. That's the latest from now from Willowbrook, Illinois. I'm Sally Schulze. I'll send it back to you. Sally, let me ask you about testing kits because obviously that's a big dis topic of discussion about availability and having them there so they could test everyone in there. Do you know if everyone in that facility was actually tested? And when they talk about containment, are the health care workers and family members, any of that people be able to come and go? Those are both great questions. As for the testing kits, we don't know if that meant everyone. I also just asked that question just minutes ago to someone here from the DuPage County Health Department. I'm like, who else is being tested? Has everyone been tested? That wasn't information they were able to give me or willing to share. Again, they said everything needed to come from the governor, his office, and all of their updates. As for people coming and going, no, they have not been letting people in. They'd put a lot of restriction on nursing facilities like this and all others in the area, and those restrictions have certainly gone up since the positive tests have happened here. You know, and, and then the visitors that have come in and out of there, how are they notifying them? Because I would imagine, right, it's however def many different points of contact. You had family members coming in, you had healthcare workers going home. You have so many people that could be within the circle, even though they've contained it in that nursing home. Right, exactly. And that's what they say is such an effort that they're still underway. It all started this weekend. But imagine they say if each of those 22 people could have had up to 90 contacts, that's where we're getting the number of possibly more than 2000 people who could have had contact with the people here. So they have said they've been getting word out to those people. What exactly that order is to those people, whether they're saying you must self quarantine, we're not sure they're not giving those details away. We're hoping to get an update this afternoon. Afternoon, DuPage County Health Department says that they will talk to the media again today only if the governor first says something with an update on this that they feel they need to follow up on. Because again, there's a lot of questions. A lot of people in this area are wanting questions like that answered. Again, the health department says it is quite an effort underway right now to make sure they've contacted all the people who may have been in contact with all the people at this facility. Okay, Sally Schulze is certainly a, a situation to keep keeping an update on and uh, we'll keep following that from DuPage County. Thanks for the very latest on that live report. All right, you are watching our live coronavirus update. This is our daily update live from Fox. We are going to come to you every day at 10 a.m., 1 p.m. Eastern time to provide you the latest information on the coronavirus outbreak nationwide. I'm Claudine Wong, and we are streaming for you on coronavirusnow.com every day for you every weekday. So thank you for joining us. We want to go now to Peru because there's a situation in Peru with folks who are stranded there. We have Emily Waters Liga, a California resident. You're stuck in Lima. The country closed its borders. The president announced this nationwide shutdown and all of a sudden you couldn't get out. Where are you right now? Um, I'm currently in a hostel in Lima. Uh, I'm with five other people. None of them are from Peru. They're also not Americans, but yeah, they are all stuck here. 
Um, the hostel's technically closed, but the owner was really nice and is letting us stay here. Um, and we don't know when we're going to be able to leave and go back to our countries. Tell me why you were there and, and were you concerned at all when you went down there that you might not be able to get home? So I actually wasn't intending to be in Peru at all. Um, I was actually doing an internship in Argentina and once the travel restrictions started being in place, I was trying to be responsible and get home before I got stuck somewhere. Um, but I had a layover in Lima that was supposed to be on Monday night, a few hours. Um, I had a flight out that night but right after boarding my flight to Lima, I was notified that, that flight was canceled. And I shortly before that, before boarding, had learned that their border was closing. And so I had no choice. I had to go into Peru. I did everything I can, I could to get a flight out, but there was no options. And I know the uh, U.S. So Embassy, was... yeah, the U.S. Embassy said just prepare for lodging. You obviously found lodging, which is good news. Uh, you say you're not alone. There's a Facebook group with hundreds of members of people just like you just waiting. Yeah, and uh, the number of people in that Facebook group keeps climbing. I first heard about it last night, and there was about 150 people that were in a WhatsApp group, and I believe the Facebook group was already in existence. I woke up this morning, and I found the Facebook group. It had 500 people in it. I just checked about 10 minutes ago, and now it has 850 people. And that's just people from the United States. There's people, I would imagine, from all over the world. There's probably way more than 850 Americans stuck here. Um, Are yeah, you this in is contact not just with me. the embassy? This is a big problem. Are you in contact with the I embassy? I have contacted yeah. the embassy. Um, they basically told me, well, once they got back to me, I emailed them a couple of days ago, and now they just got back to me and said, yeah, expect to stay there. Um, there's really not much they can do at this point. I was informed that Peru did approve that people can leave if they're returning to their country. The problem is that there isn't a way to leave. Um, there's no flights. The airport is completely closed. Even if there was a flight, taxis and public transportation are restricted at this time. There's literally police outside driving around every 10 or 15 minutes, making sure everyone stays inside. Um, we're trapped by every sense of the word. How are, are you feeling just emotionally? I know, you know, in California, people who are sheltered in place, you know, who can only leave, it, it, is, it is emotionally kind of draining and, and yet we're home, surrounded by family, with able, able to contact them. You are stuck in a place indefinitely, it appears, right now. Yeah. Um... <laughs> It's kind of up and down, I will say. Um, I, I'm doing okay. I'm trying to keep it in perspective that, you know, I, I'm lucky that I'm, I'm here. I'm not completely alone. I have a place to stay. Um, I'm healthy. Uh, my family back home is healthy. Um, I, I was prepared to be away from home at least through the end of April, so I have what I need to get through then. Um, but, yeah, no, it, it, it's hard. Um, I really want to be home, and I can't do anything about it. Well, Emily Waters Liga, we wish you could get home. We hope a solution comes to you sooner than later, and you are able to get back here. Obviously, we're still de dealing with the situation here at home, but it is different to be at home and to be far away in another country. So uh, keep us updated with your efforts. It, at least the embassy is in contact, and we hope that leads to, to a pathway back. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Emily Liga reporting from Peru from a hostel in a very, very difficult situation. All right. If you are just joining us, this is your daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong. We are going to be streaming for you every day on coronavirusnow.com at 1 p.m. Eastern. 10 p.m. or 10 a.m. Pacific, providing the latest information on this coronavirus outbreak nationwide as the situation constantly changes. Okay, we want to now go to Detroit and take you to Michigan with Dina Santafanti of Fox 2 Detroit. And let's talk about this drive through testing because we've seen long lines across the country. The president just talked about making testing more available. We certainly know there are a lot more people who want to be tested than can get that test. 
Yeah, Claudia, this is a big issue. So we're following so many stories happening here in Michigan. Drive through testing happening at a handful of hospitals here in Michigan. Uh, you know, leading up to where we are today, we said one of the big issues is that people can't get tested. Well, now testing is slowly becoming more available. People are showing up to get tested but there are too many people are showing up to get tested. So doctors are sending out a strong message saying, listen, even if you think you've been exposed to coronavirus, if you don't have serious symptoms, quarantine at home, self quarantine for 14 days because we need to save these resources for our most vulnerable patients. Here you can see some of the cars lining up. This was early this morning from our chopper uh, showing people getting in line. Here's how it works, by the way, Claudia. So you get in line and you do a screening first and that screening is a question and answer session. Where have you been? What symptoms do you have? Uh, you know, going over some basic questions and then at that point, if the medical experts feel that you should get tested, then you move on to the testing phase. You stay in your car and you get swabbed. But listen to what doctors are saying. Right now, we're trying to really use severity of illness and risk factors as the two guiding lights for who gets testing. So for example, if someone has more moderate symptoms or someone who's certainly gonna be hospitalized or someone who has chronic medical conditions like chronic lung disease, heart disease, or immune compromising conditions, we're really trying to prioritize testing for those individuals. In order to preserve our testing supplies, we're really trying to zero in on the patients where testing is gonna really uh, fundamentally change the management of the patient. So obviously we're, we're really not in a position where we can test asymptomatic patients or people with no symptoms. And we're really trying to discourage testing of people that just have mild respiratory symptoms who could otherwise just be sent home and be advised to practice supportive care and, and self-monitoring at home. Uh, so again, the, the message is if you are you know, having trouble breathing, if you're in that high risk group, definitely go and see if you should get tested. But for the rest of us, who may have been exposed, uh, we just need to stay home. Um, Claudia, another big story that's happening here in the Motor City, big news that has just been announced. Detroit's three big automakers have agreed, according to the Associated Press, have agreed to close their factories all throughout the country due to worker fears about the coronavirus. So this is sort of a reversal of a deal that we had heard about yesterday where automakers were going to scale back greatly. Uh, they're expected to release more details of this closure later today. I just got word that Ford Motor Company had now, so this is from the Associated Press, but Ford Motor Company is confirming the fact that they are suspending uh, all operations at their plants throughout the country until March 30th. So halting production at all North American plants until March 30th. The idea is they're gonna go in and do a complete sterilization process, clean, and also figure out you know, when you've got hundreds, if not thousands of people showing up for work shifts, it's almost impossible to practice this social distancing, which is what everyone is supposed to be doing. And these workers are calling us, well, auto workers are calling us saying, uh, yeah, they may be able to separate us on the line, but what about when we're on break? Uh, what about when we're arriving at work? Uh, what about when we're using the bathroom? So all of those things. Um, and Claudia, the other big thing coming here from our part of the country here in Michigan, of course, is uh, the president deciding to close the border between the United States and Canada, uh, close it off to non-essential travel. And of course, Canada to us, that's our neighbor right there mm -hmm. uh, across the water. So uh, we'll see what kind of impact that has. The president saying it shouldn't impact trade back and forth but certainly anyone else who's trying to make that trip, which is a very short trip between Detroit and Windsor. Right. It's all, it's all things that just kind of break down our, our normal habits and, and our access, and it certainly changes it. Dean, I want to go back to what you were saying about your automakers there, because certainly we saw a lot of news coming out of Tesla and their plant in Fremont in Alameda County in California talking about uh, what they were allowed to do. Workers were also expressing those same concerns about whether or not it was an essential business in, in the shelter in place that is in effect where the Tesla factory is, whether they should have basic operations only and what that means are the automakers they are saying when they open back up if they do it's full steam ahead or are they going to try to adjust what is going to be happening in those factories 
Uh, well, and, and this really highlights, uh, there's, you know, so many people are being told, figure out how to work from home, take your laptop home, but this really highlights how many jobs you can't do that. And that's where we really have to evaluate, uh, understanding what kind of risk are, are employees being put at. Um, so their safety versus the, you know, productivity of some of these uh, American companies that really are the fabric of our country, certainly the fabric of metro Detroit, you know, that old saying, as as General Motors goes, so goes the country. Very old quote, but mm -hmm. uh, almost appropriate in this situation. So the question is, oh, how can they make sure that, uh, number one, auto workers feel safe, and number two, make sure that they are indeed safe? So I think that is a, uh, we'll see, the, the story changes so much day by day. At one point, they thought that it would be okay to just uh, you know, shrink those shifts a little bit, shrink the workforce, uh, which I think is what we're trying to do at all of our workplaces right. is um, limit the number of people who are interacting with one another, which is one way. But um, certainly there's some places where that's just impossible to do. So I think that will they'll be taking a long, hard look at that from now, at least until the end of this month. And, and maybe in, in the future, as the WHO said earlier, they said maybe we all need to look at our, our worlds and how we go moving forward, even when this pandemic uh, slows down. All right, Dina, thank you so much for that report. Uh, we'll continue to watch those developments over in Michigan. All right, if you are just joining us, this is the daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong. We are live streaming every day on coronavirusnow.com. We start the broadcast at 10, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, and we'll have all the latest information for you on the coronavirus outbreak nationwide. All right, now we want to turn our attention to San Francisco, California. Schools are a big issue there. Reporter Sarah Zendedon with KTVU Fox 2 in San Francisco. Joining us now, the governor of California announced uh, how this is going to affect California schools. In fact, said, don't be surprised if no one opens up before the end of the school year. Obviously, that's going to have a very big impact on a lot of school children and families. Sarah. That's right, Claudine, a pretty unbelievable announcement by Governor Gavin Newsom yesterday. He said that it is unlikely that schools will reopen before summer break. Now, of course, 99% of K through 12 schools in California are shut down right now because of coronavirus concerns. That's 6 million school kids that are out of classrooms right now, and they thought that they would be out of school for anywhere from two to five weeks, but now that could really extend to two months. Some schools don't close until May, some don't close until June, their last days of school. So definitely a huge impact being felt all across California, all across the Bay Area, a really big concern. Of course, right here we are at James Denman Middle School. This is a, this is a middle school in San Francisco, one of many that are currently closed. Students thought they would be back here after their spring break on April 3rd, but we did speak to the San Francisco Unified School District and they told us that they're currently monitoring the information that's coming out and have to kind of work through the situation and see if they need to make any adjustments to their plan. Governor Newsom also said that California requested a waiver from the U.S. Department of Education to suspend the state's annual standardized test for this year. Now, there is an option for people. They have put, posted these educational guidelines on the um, governor's website, and he says that all of those websites have a, a lot of links, different ways for families to be able to homeschool their kids because that's truly the reality of this situation now. These children will have to be homeschooled. And of course, that's a huge burden on working parents. If parents are working full time, it's, it's pretty tough. I mean, I, I can't even imagine how hard it would be for parents to be able to balance having to go to work and then also having to homeschool their kids possibly for the next two months. So definitely something that school districts here in California are still trying to figure out. When we talked to a spokesperson with the San Francisco Unified School District, she said this is a brand new thing. They've never dealt with this here in San Francisco. Really, no district has had to deal with this. 99% of K-12 schools being shut down all across California is pretty unprecedented during this time. But, of course, they are trying to stop the spread of coronavirus, really trying to do everything that they can. So that's why the governor made that announcement yesterday. It, of course, is going to have that ripple effect across businesses, across childcare facilities, across schools. So just something that we have to just kind of stay on top of as this developing news continues to come out. But I can't help but think about all of those high school seniors who were so excited for their prom, for their graduation. All of those things may be postponed or canceled completely. Just something that 
again, we have to kind of keep our eye on school districts all across California, all across the Bay Area, definitely keeping their eye on this one, Claudine, and, and also letting parents know as soon as possible um, when, when things are developing and, and, you know, the next steps for this situation. Yes, it's, it's certainly heartbreaking. I know a lot of families were holding out hope that uh, some of the senior year, when specifically talking about seniors, that that could be salvaged in some way. Seniors in college, seniors in high school, anyone who is about to celebrate, you know, kind of a, a mark on what happens next. When you talk about the lower schools, and, and let's be clear, Sarah, right? Even though the governor said don't expect these schools to be open before summer. No one's officially said we are definitely not going to open. They all have different dates kind of spread out. I think only, uh, I know Kansas ordered them to be closed uh, specifically for the end of the year, but Governor Newsom was just trying to prepare people. There are also other services like feeding children who were on uh, reduced uh, and, and, and meals and, and things like that and making sure that the children get fed even if they're not in school because a lot of children depend on meals. That's right. And actually here at James Denman Middle School in San Francisco, they are actually um, shutting down their operation for the morning. They have been doing this every day for the last two days from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. They've had students come here and they can get breakfast, lunch and dinner. They originally weren't supposed to actually give out dinners, but there was a generous donation here and they've been able to provide dinner for all of these students. So students can come here or to 13 other locations across the San Francisco Unified School District and pick up those meals. Of course, that is it's, it's a scary time for a lot of people. But the last thing that should be on students and, and families minds is where am I going to get my food? So the San Francisco Unified School District and really school districts all across the Bay Area, all across California have really stepped up to make sure that no student goes hungry during this time. All right. That is good news. All right. Sarah Zendanon reporting live from San Francisco. Thanks so much for that report. And if you are just joining us, we want to remind you that this is the daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong, and we're going to be live streaming every day. It starts at 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll have all the latest information for you on the coronavirus outbreak nationwide. All right, we now want to go to our nation's capital and go to Washington, D.C., and live to reporter Abigail Hausloner with the Washington Post, and we talk about U.S. deaths and tracking who's been affected by this. Uh, where are we in terms of numbers? We saw New York have a, a big spike in the number of cases there. Right. Well, yesterday we climbed over 100 deaths in the United States. Uh, last I checked a couple hours ago, we were at over 110, 111. Uh, we expect that number to continue to climb rapidly, uh, especially as cases accelerate, as testing has been rolled out in many more places than it was a week ago. Uh, we are well over 1,500 confirmed cases now. Uh, and look for more updates as the day goes on. Yeah, you know, when we listen to the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force update, uh, they warned that the curves that we're watching in terms of cases will not be stable till next week because if this huge rollout of tests come out, we will see many more people tested. Do we feel like the number of deaths, though, because those people who have the most severe illnesses theoretically would be the people who would be tested, you know, first because they were so severely ill. Do we feel like that number and that curve will also be unreliable in the next few days as we continue to see uh, more testing roll out? I think we really don't know at this point because it, it will depend, as you said, you know, the number of tests rolling out could, you know, obviously uh, show us, you know, lead to an, incre an, an even bigger spike in confirmed cases. Uh, but also the disease is spreading and we don't know how rapidly. And, you know, so folks who are most vulnerable to the disease, the elderly, people with pre-existing conditions as they contract the disease. And again, those are folks who are overrepresented in the death toll so far. Um, as the disease spreads, you know, we could see the death toll continue to spike or expand even more dramatically. Uh, we just don't know. Yeah, the number we might see change the most, I would think, is this percentage when they say 7%, because they've talked about mortality rate uh, among the people who are getting coronavirus. If you have many more people who are proven to be infected by the coronavirus with mild symptoms, then th there is that belief that we'll know that fewer people, while our most vulnerable population, our older population, and people with underlying conditions are at risk, uh, we'll know kind of the severity of, of how most people will react to, to contracting the virus. That's right. Clinicians and infectious disease specialists who I've talked to 
uh, talk about one of the big unknowns, which is that, you know, we don't know how many people out there are asymptomatic, you know, who contract the disease, maybe young, relatively healthy people who contract the disease, have no idea that they have it, uh, but might still be infectious, as well as all these cases who are just getting mildly ill, you know, and are obviously not getting tested or are not going to the hospital. You know, we don't know the scale there. So certainly there is the belief and understanding among specialists that the death rate so far is a bit inflated because there is so much uh, under testing that you know not enough people are being tested, uh, and so that that percentage could go down. Uh, however, what's what's key to look at is the percentage uh, of people uh, of the cases you know that we know of the the death toll percentage among those who are particularly vulnerable. So we look at the percentage of elderly who get it. Uh, who are passing away, as well as, you know, the percentage of those with hypertension, with diabetes, and so on. That's where it's really critical to pay attention to get a sense of just how vulnerable those populations are. And certainly when you're talking about availability of healthcare system, and we talk about flattening this curve, we're talking about a number of hospital beds, the number number of respirators and ventilators and people to ways to help people once they get sick. And when you talk about the curve and you look over at Italy, and certainly where we might be headed in the next week if some of our efforts don't don't curb what's happening here to lead us there, the next week could be very telling. That's right. I, I think a lot of experts out there are, are really anxious uh, about what's to come. One, inter one interesting thing that a, an infectious disease specialist pointed out to me the other day uh, that you know these could be important factors or that Italy's population uh, is a lot older than ours. Uh, on the other hand, the U.S. population has a much bigger challenge in terms of obesity rates uh, and hypertension and some of these other critical underlying conditions, uh, as well as obviously insurance. You know, we have a lot of Americans who are uninsured or underinsured, which could hinder their access to health care or their willingness to go and seek treatment. Uh, and so we just don't know yet how dramatically those factors are going to exacerbate the situation and where we're going to end up, you know, in relation to places like Italy. Mm, it is a very, very scary time as we try to figure out what's next. OK, reporter Abigail Hausloner with The Washington Post as we track these numbers and stare at these numbers for some kind of answers. Thanks so much. And we want to remind you, if you are also just joining us, that uh, this is your daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong. We are going to come to you streaming live every day on coronavirusnow.com. We come to you at 10 a.m. Pacific at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll have the very latest from the coronavirus outbreak nationwide. We want to go now to Houston because when we talk about all the businesses that are shutting down or minimizing their services, you have a lot of people at home. We get consumer reporter Heather Sullivan with Fox 26 in Houston. These are the biggest questions that you've been getting right about unemployment. Can you get fired over child care issues for the people who still have to go to work or who are belong to these essential businesses? What if their school has shut down and they're home with their children and they're not really sure what to do in this this uncertain time? Yeah, that's really, we're hearing a lot from our viewers and I'm sure people around the country are sharing the same question. So one, they're worried about the virus, but on the other hand, they have these huge worries about their financial picture. Uh, we had a number of um, uh, businesses basically send people home. It was sort of a, a very um, last minute decision that came up. And so it left a lot of people not really knowing uh, answers about, well, is there any way for me to get paid while I'm sitting at home over the next couple of weeks. So we got questions about, doesn't my employer owe me money? Well, in the state of Texas, uh, no, they don't have to pay you while you're sitting out. Uh, we asked a legal expert about that. We also, as you were saying, we're getting questions about, uh, well, um, what if I'm supposed to be at work, but my kids are home and now I can't get daycare. Can I lose my job if I can't go in? Or what if I'm not comfortable going to work? We had someone contact us who works in a uh, 
a department store uh, just the other day. They were concerned about that department store still open. They want them to come into work to help customers, uh, but this particular woman cares for her elderly father. So she was very concerned about, do I have to go to work uh, because I might you know, bring this virus home to my father? Um, the law, particularly in Texas anyway, does tend to favor businesses. Um, if you're not able to report for work, whether it's because uh, you can't get childcare or whether it's because you're not comfortable going, we hope, of course, that businesses will work with people. Um, we understand a number of businesses are trying to be as flexible as they can, um, but the bottom line is uh, nobody really owes you that paycheck from the business side, and there are those possibilities you could lose your job. Uh, the positive, though, is that our Texas Workforce Commission is saying do apply for unemployment benefits. And I think a lot of people don't know that. They know they're just out for a couple of weeks, at least that's what they're being told right now, um, but they don't know, well, then I might qualify for unemployment benefits. But our Texas Workforce Commission is saying, uh, yes, uh, we will review those applications. And of course, depending on, uh, you know, the, the, the terms that you were, you know, put out of work and all of that, uh, they'll review it all on a case by case basis. But they are saying, if you have just recently uh, lost your employment temporarily or permanently because of the coronavirus, they do want people to apply. They're encouraging people to apply either by phone or uh, by internet. So of course they're seeing that uh, because most people are home and using those um, tools. Um, however, workforce uh, solution centers here in Texas are open. They're uh, having people, they can come in and apply in person. I do wanna sort of give you a little bit of um, an outlook that we got when we went and visited one of these um, centers because there are other people there uh, who've already been looking for work, people who've been looking for work for a while. And we interviewed a woman, for example, she's a, a single mother of four children and very concerned because she just recently um, lost her job and is now um, looking for work. And she says, everything's closed. It's really hard to even apply for jobs right now uh, because things are closed. Because she's low income, she doesn't have internet at home. Uh, she says, I you know, would normally be able to go to the library to uh, be able to go online and take care of applying for unemployment and applying for um, jobs and things like that. And she's saying that uh, you know, right now access is limited. Um, so, so people are really feeling the hardships you know, in every direction because of this. But again, um, the Workforce um, Commission is encouraging people apply for unemployment. And of course, now that the House and the Trump administration have reached the deal about about increasing funding for unemployment benefits, that will help. That is aimed at helping people who have been forced out of work because of this situation. So that money uh, is being sent. However, when we've talked to the Texas officials, they're still sort of figuring out how all of that is gonna work. So they don't really have a completely firmed up plan yet. They're still working that out, but um, that is hopefully something that is going to be Heather, helping people. Yeah. We've also been getting just a lot of questions about I'm sorry, I say the question again? Heather, I just wanted to kind of weigh in because it does seem like we're I've, I've in, in so many different gray yeah. areas in terms of, you know, whether if even if you are supposed to go to work, let's say you don't feel very well, 14 days, a lot of people don't have 14 days of sick time. Do we think this is going to be one of those situations where lawmakers either at the state level and local level and federal level will have to draft some laws that that actually address this, whether in unemployment benefits, sick leave time, you know, that it's coronavirus specific, pandemic specific, because what we have on the books really just isn't applicable to the situation that we're looking at right now. Yeah, that's absolutely a situation I think that uh, lawmakers both federally and uh, at the state level are having to navigate uh, to try and figure out, okay, if, if particularly if this goes on for an extended period of time. And that was another question that uh, employees have been asking is, you know, do I have to use my sick time uh, for this if I'm not sick? I'm, you know, you're losing the, the time you may have saved for an occasion of being sick, but you're being forced to sit out, um, you know, or the family leave uh, act, that sort of 
sort of thing. So I think those questions are still, um, you know, being looked at and having to be worked out both federally and statewide. If this goes on for an extended period of time, uh, they may very well have to pass legislation that's very uh, specific to this. And maybe it will have lasting effects should we, you know, be in a, a crisis like this again. Um, but having to figure out what do you do um, in terms of, you know, if we're going to have people sitting out for such a, a long period of time in terms of uh, making sure that they are still able to uh, apply for and qualify for uh, unemployment benefits or other benefits that are out there. Yeah. Uh, we've been hearing also people had questions about, um, you know, their uh, SNAP benefits, Medicaid, uh, WIC, um, and again, um, uh, state agencies are saying go ahead and apply for those, whether you've already been on them or if you need to now apply for those benefits, apply for those online if you can uh, to go ahead and get those processes going. Don't wait. Uh, if you may not uh, you know, know what's going on right now, they're saying just go ahead and get your applications in. It's better to have applied than to be sitting out waiting. Is, yes. um, we also got a lot of questions because a lot of people just have had had uh, had concerns about um, whether they could make uh, credit card payments, mortgage payments, uh, student loan payments. So we've been giving people some imp information about uh, basically the federal regulators have reached out to a number of the banks um, and financial institutions saying we really want you uh, to work with people. So a number of the banks and credit cards are saying we will offer uh, different types of assistance. They just basically are encouraging consumers to contact them let them know that they are already concerned. They may not make a payment. Yep. They can't make a full payment, whatever the situation is. Um, and they yep. can try and work out some of those um, right. arrangements, whether it's letting them pay late or partial or waiving some interest. Heather Sullivan, thank you so much. Uh, it is a lot to take in for people, whether it's from work, credit cards, rent, mortgages, and certainly uh, a lot of uh, territory that we still don't know what it looks like ahead. So thank you so much for that as we continue to try to figure out really what's next for us in every aspect of our life. Now, if you are just joining us right now, this is the daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong. We're gonna be streaming live every day 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern is when our broadcast starts, so we appreciate you joining us. We'll have all the latest information for you on the coronavirus outbreak nationwide. Now, so many segments of the population are trying to figure out what's next, and not alone in that, we've got high school kids who are trying to figure out, really, they had their whole time planned in terms of AP tests in terms of SAT, ACT, and all that's changing. So we've got Casey Near with collegewise.com joining us live via Skype, talking about these schools and SAT and ACT cancellations. I know there's talk about doing these AP tests at home, and that's, you know, a brave new world for these uh, seniors and juniors who've been taking these AP classes all year long. We should hear more Friday, right, about what happens there. That's correct. This is absolutely evolving. We're in pretty uncharted waters here. Um, so the College Board is set to announce something any day now. They say by Friday um, that they'll announce what's going to be happening with AP tests. Now, I, I sense this is by no means a final announcement. They've teased that it could be at home testing, but we all recognize the many, many complications uh, and inequities in that potential rollout. So they are likely standing by to figure out if that's a sustainable solution. You know, I've seen so many high school seniors' parents posting a lot about just being crushed for them in terms of whether it's senior prom, senior ball, graduation ceremonies, things we don't know are what's gonna happen. They should be right now getting college decisions and making plans to visit colleges and figure out where they want to go. The juniors are sitting there saying, can I take one of these SAT and ACT tests twice? You might be taking away the one date that I got the score that I hated, but now I don't have enough time to take it again before college applications are due. How much do you think this is this going to kind of, every university and college across the country is gonna to have to look at how they look at these applicants next year as well, I would think. Absolutely, and, and you're exactly right. I think there's, there's two sides of this. One is we have to recognize we're, we're talking about teenagers and, and their parents. And so there's an obvious emotional part of this. So there's a lot of loss right now that, that teen, teenagers are feeling. It's a disruption of their normal routines of seeing their friends. Um, and then there's the mechanical sides, which are they are actually things closing and adjusting and changing. So in terms of the mechanics, you know, there are test dates that are closing. 
um, or canceling. We've had two SAT closures, the March date and the May. We have one April ACT and then kind of a big old question mark with AP exams coming up in May. Um, but what I know to be true is that historically colleges and universities have always been generously adept at, at adapting to what's happening. We've seen this time and again with hurricanes, um, the wildfires that happened in California this past fall, we saw colleges extend their deadlines uh, because of it. So I think I always urge families uh, to consider and remember that there are individual human beings behind those colleges, and they are also handling and juggling big decisions, and they are always going to do what's in the best interest of, of fielding a class, which means they're going to have to navigate this um, in a gracious way. Yes, and it affects everyone across the nation, and so everyone will be in the same boat. Casey Neer from CollegeWise.com, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that. And if you are just joining us, we are coming to you. This is the Coronavirus Now Daily Update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong, and we're going to come to you live streaming 10 a.m. Pacific every day, 1 p.m. Eastern providing the latest information on the coronavirus outbreak nationwide. This is a situation that is constantly changing, and so we want to make sure that we bring all the latest information for you. And we know you have a lot of questions, so I want to bring in Dr. Noel Reed, who is a family physician at Trinity Health and Wellness based in Los Angeles. Dr. Reed, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we want to get to viewers' questions because we have people sure. who are able to, on Facebook where it's streaming, where they're watching, or on our website, be able to give us questions and really kind of weigh in. And so mm -hmm. let's just go through some of the questions that we're getting. One person asking, what is the risk of getting COVID-19 on an airplane? Certainly people are being encouraged not to travel mm -hmm. unless they have to, but those who are getting on planes are trying to figure out the risk. Yeah, so I think that the risk would be what it would be at any public facility. Um, you know, as we understand the way that this virus is primarily transmitted is through direct human contact, typically through contact with um, respiratory secretions, either through um, someone coughing or sneezing on you or on surfaces. And so when you're in an, an a, an environment where there could be high human contact, then there is a potential risk of exposure. I would say at this point, it's probably um, a lower likelihood given the fact that airlines have been doing much more than what they have been doing before in terms of uh, disinfection. And I think the passengers have, as well, being more conscious as to what's been going on, also wiping down and making sure that they're doing their part to keep the, um, the plane or the aircraft clean. So I think that, you know, as any time um, of travel and as we have always been encouraging during cold and flu season, that there would be a risk potentially because you'll be around other um, humans, but that if you use proper uh, protocols, such as washing your hands consistently, wiping down areas that, that that you will be in a direct contact um, that that should help to minimize your risk of uh, exposure and those planes are certainly empty these days and so that makes it a little yeah. easier to not sit right next to someone you know our second viewer question mm -hmm. is interesting because it asks is there a risk of catching coronavirus on the cruise obviously we saw from the the princess <laughs> cruise lines and the number of people we had infected there that it, it does happen very quickly and and the cruise lines mm -hmm. have shut down but what is it about that cruise ship that is it because everyone is just touching services if they if they change cleaning mm -hmm. protocols would that change it or are you just more at risk when you're on that boat i think that um you know we don't know exactly why um that it's such a, a rapid rate but i it's likely because that they're such close quarters you know it is difficult to uh, social distance yourself. You know, when you're on a cruise ship, there's so many people on the cruise ship and there's um, so many surfaces that you come in contact with that I think it would be rather difficult um, to minimize the transmission. And then as well, you know, there's been some concern that maybe there's other routes of transmission that maybe it's not just respiratory um, droplets. Could there be fecal oral route uh, transmission? There was some information that came out of Chinese CDC where there was a study done where they took um, 
rectal samples um, or swabs of individuals who were admitted uh, for COVID-19 and the virus was found um, in the fecal matter. So that would bring some concern when you're in a cruise ship situation where there's such tight quarters, could there perhaps be fecal oral route of transmission that can also speed up the process of things? Um, so I think that, you know, essentially a cruise ship is kind of like a sitting Petri dish. You know, there's so many pathogens that are sitting there in close contact. It makes it very difficult to not come in contact with those things that could be infectious. And certainly the cruise industry will have to figure out how to move forward because there are quite a few people who love cruises and and yeah. i would argue that a, a big part of the senior population likes cruises as well and oh, so for, certainly for that sure. puts them at risk um, yes let's talk about face masks because obviously the government has asked the general public not to buy face masks because it takes away from healthcare workers and then there's a second question of if they're even doing what they're supposed to do. So this person asked, should I wear a face mask if I have to travel through an airport? I have seen people wearing face masks if they mm -hmm. are going to the supermarket. Should you be doing that? Does it does it make a difference? Does it keep you safer? I, I get the impression that it keeps people safer from you than it keeps you safe from them. Right, so if you are asymptomatic, meaning that you do not have any symptoms, we are not recommending that you wear a face mask. So the purpose of a face mask is for those individuals who have symptoms. So let's say they have a cough, they're sneezing frequently. So they wear the mask to prevent those respiratory droplets to get out into the environment where other people can, can be uh, infected. As well as for those perhaps who are taking care of individuals who are ill. So hence healthcare workers or those who are caretakers. If you're going to be in close contact with someone who's ill, yes, you would make, you would wear a face mask to prevent transmission. But for those who don't have symptoms, you know, there is some thought that you could potentially um, contaminate and, and increase the risk of infection when you wear a face mask. Because if you think about what you do during the course of the day, you're touching surfaces, you know, and then you're likely touching your mask, changing it, taking it off, putting it back on. So if you are contaminating the mask and putting the mask on throughout the day, then those pathogens are sitting just up against the nose and the mouth to invade and infect. So it would probably be, you know, more an, an increase of risk for transmission uh, to wear a mask throughout the day if, if you don't have any symptoms. So I would say no to mask at this point um, if, if you're asymptomatic. Yeah, going back to, again, just washing your hands a lot it's better than, than, than anything else we can do. All right, exactly. let's talk about our next question. Can coronavirus be spread through public pools or hot tubs? I'm not sure how many people are going to public pools right now, but there, you know, everyone wants the temperature thing to to kill the virus. So I can see some people thinking, oh, maybe you hop in the hot tub and, it, and it's OK. I, I don't believe we know at this point that temperature will necessarily kill the virus. Um, you know, anything that is going to allow for close human contact is a risk. So if you're in the water, regardless of the temperature, um, you know, there should be cause for concern. And certainly we know that there are other um, pathogens that can be passed um, in pools and um, in hot tubs. So I wouldn't say that based upon temperature alone, you would be safer. And um, at this time, as we're to be social distancing ourselves, I just don't think it would be a, a, a smart thing to get in any pool or hot tub with others at this time. Yeah, it's just good advice. All right, here's a big question because I watched an interview with someone uh, just yesterday who was self-isolating because of possible symptoms and the only person mm -hmm. in their household that they could come into contact with was their dog. <laughs> and, and that was very <laughs> comforting, right? So then yes. this leads to the question, should I isolate myself away from my pets if I'm sick? Can they catch the virus? Because certainly, I mean, in a time where we need human contact to comfort us the most is the time where we should not, we are being told not to have any human contact. So what about the dog? So what about the dog? This is a good question. So um, actually what the public health department, so LA's public health department is recommending is that if you are a person of interest, if you are self-isolating because you have symptoms um, or you are known um, COVID-19 uh, uh, positive, that you do isolate yourself from your pets. Um, because we don't really know exactly what the transmission uh, could be with domesticated animals, but we do know that coronavirus is a zoonotic virus. So trans transmission can occur between animal to human, and essentially that's how we believe that this outbreak started. Um, so as it stands now, what is recommended during self-isolation is that you do 
keep some distance. Um, so you probably don't want to, you know, kiss your dog or let them lick your face. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we, we do need to have some type of connection, you know, uh, during this time to help us emotionally. But it probably be the best thing as we're still figuring things out to keep your distance while you're having symptoms. Oh, that's going to make it so hard. All right, Dr. Yeah. Lee, we're going to check back in with you in just a bit with more questions. If you are watching live right now on Facebook, you can uh, put your questions in the comments below and we can see them there. And we'd appreciate it. We always love more questions. If you are just joining us, we want to tell you that this is the daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong and we are live streaming every day on coronavirusnow.com at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. And we'll have all the latest information for you on this coronavirus outbreak as it takes over the nation. All right, we want to go now to Tampa and we want to talk about uh, just how we're all dealing with this and our coping strategies. We got Anthony Brinkley, who is the CEO of Brink Consulting which is a leadership development firm. And we were just talking about how we're all dealing with this in places where you have a shelter in place and people aren't interacting with people. You can go online, you can do stuff. But someone was just saying in one of the shelter in place areas, they're like, this is only day two and it's already difficult. Can you talk about just the resiliency and how we kind of get through this crisis? Well, the first thing is to um, understand what resiliency is. And resiliency simply is, to have something that you're confronted with and then you have the ability to adapt in real time. And then once you adapt in real time, you actually bounce forward. A lot of people always talk about bouncing back, but you, if you just bounce back, you just get back to the place where you started. So as people are going through these circumstances, to your point, when you're talking about social distancing and things of that nature, the first thing that we have to tell people to do is you need to acknowledge what's going on in your life. A lot of times we'll tell people, hey, you know, ignore it or push through it or, or but, but no, you have to acknowledge your feelings and then examine if my feelings are exaggerated. And if they are, then there are things you can do to actually de-escalate yourself. And if they're not exaggerated, then you get information to try to apply to move forward. Yeah. Do you where do you find people struggle the most when you talk about bouncing forward and, and doing that? It, it, I, I feel like people are saying, OK, I'm, I'm going to be positive. I understand this. I understand it rationally. But you have so so many emotions, whether they are fear over losing your job and paying your rent, where they are children who are crushed about losing the last bits of their high school experience or their next college experience, what, what, whatever it is. You know, there's the what your head says <laughs> and then what your heart says. So to your question, I tell people simply that a crisis equals information. It could be good things. We got promoted. We had a, we had a first child. Uh, someone's in the hospital. There's a pandemic going on. So the first thing that people have to do is understand that, that things are going to happen in life. And so when these things happen in life, again, what I, what I, I stated before, examine that if, 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 if the significance truly to the level that we're saying it is. I'll give you a quick example. When I was in combat, Everything in combat is exaggerated, it's magnified. So people that didn't have someone at home, if they met someone over the internet, they fell in love because they didn't think anyone's gonna be waiting for them to come back. Or if something was going on at the house, they were like, I gotta get back home. So a lot of times the first thing is take a breath and understand that this is, we have people like you all that are providing platforms and forms to give information out and concise information to help people move through this. And then within our communities, there are resources available. And a lot of times we don't know what is those resources are, which speaks even more to the platform that you have. So the first thing again is to go back and just make sure that you're not exaggerating something, make it more than it is. Because a lot of people that are watching right now, they're sitting at home, they're in a safe environment. There's, there is some fluctuation about what's gonna happen with their job and other circumstances, but they still don't know. So, you know, this is cliche, but live one day at a time because anxiety is typically focusing on something that may happen, but it hasn't happened. So I would just tell people, take a breath, live one day at a time and, and avail themselves to resources that you all are doing such a great job of making available. All right, Anthony Brinkley, great advice. We will breathe deeply here as well uh, from On The Brink Consulting as we try to make our way through this. Thanks so much. All right, and if you are just joining us right now, this is the daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong, and we always start our live streaming at 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern, and we bring you all the very latest information on this nationwide coronavirus outbreak.
All right, let's now go to San Francisco because we want to go to uh, Mark Naveau. He is a former FEMA coordinator. He's joining us from the KTVU Fox 2 newsroom in the San Francisco Bay Area. And of course, Mark, the big news that we heard today was that FEMA was activated in all regions. So they are prepared to do really kind of whatever is necessary. What did that mean to you in terms of what FEMA can do now? Uh, good morning, Claudine. FEMA has been in a support role in the state of California for quite a while. While we had the cruise ship in the uh, bay and they were trying to re uh, get p folks back home, basically. So they've been already participating. Also, at the national level, they're in a supporting role to health and human services as they've been dealing with this crisis. What the president has done is by signing an executive order or a disaster declaration, it's elevated their levels of authority. And so if you can, FEMA's like a general contractor, if you will. You're trying to redo your house or something, you hire a general contractor who will oversee the other subcontractors, kind of manage the project for you. That's what FEMA does. It, it has a, a national response center in Washington, D.C. Each federal department has a presence there. FEMA comes in, it organizes a plan, brings people to the table, starts to organize what each state wants to do. So in this particular case, not only do they have the National uh, Coordination Center open in Washington, D.C., they've also sent teams to each state capital. And those teams are embedded in the emergency operations center of that capital. And they're starting to forge relationships, develop plans on how they're going to roll that out. Now, FEMA can offer a number of different services in this case. They provide what's known as an incident command framework or an incident action plan. So that's what they're good at is organizing the whole effort in partnership with the other federal departments. And this isn't just about medical. I mean, that's the major component to it. But there's going to be other aspects that come into play here. How do you, Mark, let me interrupt you really Absolutely. quickly, because when you talk about this and you talk about what FEMA has responded to, there's so many different situations. You know, sometimes in, in television news, we say, you know, every live shot we do is practice for the huge one, the major mm. disaster, the major coverage that we have to do when we have to be on, you know, hour after hour and make sure that we're providing the best information. When FEMA comes into a situation, you're dealing with state governments and, and different officials who want to do the right thing, but how important is organization to make sure that it's rolled out at smoothly and how prepared is FEMA to do that to make sure that when you're talking about a nationwide crisis and a pandemic that things will be organized smoothly because certainly there's been frustration with everything from testing to just trying to, to wrap our brains and our hands around this. Yeah, just kind of set it in context. I mean, we're talking about a national disaster. That's the key to this. It's overwhelming current resources. That's why it's a disaster. But FEMA has existing relationships in each one of these states on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, training and exercise through grants and things of that nature. So they know some of the folks that are going to be dealing with this, which is nice. They operate under what's known as an incident command group. It's like a board of directors for each state. And there are the governor, uh, he may appoint somebody, they call it a state coordinating officer to represent him or her. They've got a federal coordinating officer from the federal government standpoint, and then they have local officials. And that's like a board of directors. They decide on the direction for 24 hours, formulate a plan with the staff, and then they stay focused on what the priority and the objectives are for that period of time. And so in this case, the good news too, not only can they provide coordination, but FEMA also has the ability to um, send out electronic funds. I mean, that's kind of what they do is provide funding for disaster victims. So we're talking about the economic component here. Along with the IRS, FEMA has the capability to do that in a pretty quick fashion electronically. So folks, hopefully once they settle on what they want to do, they, they have that option to be able to help with that. Is there any concern about capacity? Because usually you're going to a specific region, right? Hurricane yeah. Katrina hits and you go to that one part of the country or you have another tornado and you go to that part of the country. You have wildfires in California. Now you're focused on that. Is there a problem with making these online, you know, uh, resources available to people? Can you do that across all 50 states and all regions and do that smoothly with uh, FEMA? That is going to be a challenge because you're talking about a countrywide, you know, disaster, pandemic. It's not, you know, there are certain areas that it's more focused, Washington, California, New York. So we know that some of the other states may not require as much need right now, or it may roll through where you can focus on a few states now, move your resources to another location as it goes. 
But that is going to be the challenge with all the hurricanes, the wildfires, FEMA is, you know, they're, they're challenged in staffing. But they also have, you know, what they can call a cadre of federal employees that they can roll up to emergencies that don't typically work for FEMA during a nine to five Monday through Friday role. They're working for other agencies, Department of Transportation, Agriculture, Forest Service, whatever but they can be called in for particular purposes such as this, and that's about 10,000 employees. So I'm sure they're gonna be drawn upon those folks too. It'll be testing the system though. Do you think the FEMA system has been set up? Because everything's being tested right now. Our communications, our ability to respond, all of it is being put to the test. And do you, from your experience with FEMA, do you have confidence that, that it will pass this test as, as a agency? Or if we'll have to rethink now that we are dealing with something that we haven't dealt with in, in 100 years to make sure that we're ready whenever it hits again? Yeah, two sides to that in that you want to use the existing systems you have in place because this now is not the time to have to restart a whole new process, a new department, a new organization to be effective. So this is the agency in terms of incident management and coordination that the federal government use. And they're good at creating partnerships with state and local officials. Like I said earlier, they've, they've done that to some degree. So what's going to be key as we go through this as a country is those partnerships, the ability to communicate with different folks, the ability to work through challenges. If the system can't handle the magnitude, they're gonna have to figure out ways to do that. And that's gonna fall upon those executive decision makers. And because they have relationships and they're coordinated under an incident command system, now I think they have better chance of being successful if they didn't implement this. All right, former FEMA coordinator Mark Naveau, we certainly hope uh, they have all the success in the Absolutely. world because we all benefit from, from that as well, and we appreciate your insight. Uh, if you are just joining us, this is uh, your daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong. We're going to be live streaming for you every day on coronavirusnow.com at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific. We'll have all the latest information for you. Certainly things change hour by hour, sometimes minute by minute. And so we're going to bring all the latest information for you on the coronavirus outbreak nationwide. We have been asking for some viewer questions. And so if you're watching on Facebook, you can always respond in comments and we will see those questions. And then we ask physicians to weigh in to help us get you all the information that you need. So we want to bring in Dr. Noel Reed back uh, with Trinity Health and Wellness as we talk about more questions that we're getting from viewers. And, and this is the big question I think that a lot of people are asking when it comes to how many of us could be carrying coronavirus and not mm -hmm. knowing it. And so this is the first question that we're getting. Can I catch the virus from someone who isn't coughing or sneezing who doesn't seem sick? And that, that is a big question mm -hmm. for people when they're sitting there mm -hmm. wondering. I think it makes us a little scared of everyone around us. Yeah, and you know, that's an excellent question. And as we've all experienced, I think at this point is that this is an evolving process. You know, we're learning more data um, day to day and things are changing day to day. And there has been some concern that asymptomatic individuals could potentially be passing the virus and likely why it's been um, spreading so rapidly and making it so difficult and so challenging to contain. And so I think at this time, we have to kind of move with that um, in mind and that there may be individuals who have no symptoms or very mild symptoms um, and be sp spreading the virus. And hence why um, the social distancing and the closing of schools and minimizing um, public um, um, gatherings and things of that nature is so important because it does appear that there is some significant spread with um, asymptomatic individuals. And the fact that we are behind now a bit, a, a great amount <laughs> in terms of testing, we really don't know the true community spread. Yes, and, and that, that is that unknown is, is so concerning. And that kind of actually leads us to our next question. You know, I have mm -hmm. in-laws and I have uh, parents who are in that at-risk category and yeah. I'm scared to go visit them and they're not in a senior care home. So I guess the question yeah. is, should I avoid visiting someone in a senior care home even if I don't feel sick? And really, should we be visiting our older relatives or our older loved yeah. ones even if we're not mm -hmm. showing any symptoms? 
So for in a senior care home, I would say yes. You, you would want to stay away at this time. Um, any uh, facility where there is um, close quarters and especially where you have a high proportion of um, elderly or those of advanced age, uh, this would not be the time to visit. Um, so we would still wanna keep connected to them. So that means call, Skype, FaceTime, but not face-to-face uh, -face, uh, visitations for now. And for those family members who are older, um, you know, I think that's something that we really need to think about at this point because, you know, the numbers are growing and uh, we are seeing that this is, uh, the community spread is likely far beyond uh, what we have even um, thought it would be at this point. And in an abundance of caution, I think for now, for those family members who are over 60, 65 years of age, and definitely if they have uh, chronic health conditions, such as heart disease, diabetes, lung disease, it would be a best um, approach to stay away for now. Still connect because we need that human connection, but in a different way. Connection is so important. Okay, here's our another question. Yeah. What about people who are pregnant? Can the virus cause problems for pregnancy? Do we know that answer? I don't think there's a whole lot of data as yet uh, in regards to pregnancy because again, you know, this is a new virus to, for us and so we're still kind of learning things. As far as we know at this point, um, there does not appear to be any um, significant or any severe uh, uh, um, complications or concerns for the fetus or that um, a pregnant woman would have um, severe uh, outcome. However, we do know that being pregnant is a vulnerable state. And so even with other respiratory infections such as flu, um, I think that you know for pregnant women, certainly they should be on alert and be more cautious at this time because we really don't know exactly um, how things could potentially play out. So you know, it, at this time, as we're still kind of finding things, um, I would say that for pregnant women, certainly they should be on a higher sense of alert than others. Yeah, and I don't think actually they're in that at-risk group when the, when they talk about people who need testing first. I don't think pregnant women qualify in that at-risk yeah, no, group for needing. Pregnant women are not in a, are not at this time um, in that high-risk group, but we do mention that uh, those who have compromised immune systems, you know, to be cautious. And technically, you know, during pregnancy, it is harder to fight off infection. Yeah. So, um, you know, at that at that time, I would say that it, just be careful. Still wanna yeah, be, be careful. very careful. What about yeah. nursing moms? When you talk about breastfeeding, right? If someone's a little sniffly, or maybe they're even asymptomatic, you are so scared mm -hmm. that you're going to pass something to your your nursing infant. Mm -hmm. Do we know anything about spreading this through breastfeeding? I don't believe at this point that we know that there could be uh, spread through breastfeeding. Um, if anything, uh, there may be antibodies, you know, that are given uh, during breastfeeding time. So I don't believe at this time that we are telling moms who are having symptoms uh, to stop breastfeeding. Um, so I would say for now that would that would be a no. Okay, and and so here's yeah. here's the thing I was talking to with someone uh, as well in the newsroom. We were saying, man, if I sniffle, if I sneeze, all of a sudden, you know, and and it's totally normal. People have allergies. Mm -hmm. People have common colds. People have a lot of things that aren't coronavirus yeah. and people are trying to figure out if they should be worried. Children, they often have runny noses and coughs. That's just mm -hmm. a part of especially toddlers, you know, that that seems to be kind of an everyday thing. So our next question from a viewer uh, is my child has a runny nose and a cough. Should I be worried it's coronavirus? Well, you know, it's hard to say at this point because, you know, everything looks and sounds like coronavirus right now, right? Um, you know, we have a lot of people who have presented atypically, so not um, those symptoms that we typically look for, like high fever and dry cough. Um, and as it as far as the pediatric population, um, fortunately, it appears um, for now that they have been um, minimally affected in terms of when they have been exposed, typically they have mild illness and there hasn't been any significant uh, deaths among the population. However, there is some concern that, you know, children perhaps could be spreading the virus as well because the symptoms are so mild or may look like, you know, the common cold or an allergy or what have you. So I would say that, you know, at this time, if you do have a child that's sick, um, especially if they have a fever, then you would want to keep them away from others. Um, and of course, it'll be difficult to, you know, isolate your child you know, as a parent, but just be very cautious in terms of what you are doing in the home, making sure to disinfect on a regular basis. Um, yes. 
And, you know, if they have a fever at that time, you know, maybe you would want to wear a mask um, during the time that they are um, having symptoms. But, um, you know, it's a difficult time for us right now because there's still just a lot that we don't know. Yes, it is so scary. All right. Dr. Noel Reed, we want to remind our viewers that you can post comments if you're watching on Facebook and we will see them there. We appreciate all these answers to these tough questions that so many people have and we'll continue to try to answer them for all our viewers. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Thank you. All right, and if you are just joining us now, we want to tell you that uh, we are uh, giving you your daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong. This update comes to you every day. It starts at 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern. We're going to bring you all the very latest on the coronavirus and this nationwide uh, epidemic and this pandemic that we are trying to deal with, and we are live streaming for you. So we appreciate you joining us. So much information has come down today from the president, the White House task force. FEMA is now activated in all regions. We have cases in all 50 states, so we continue to monitor all those developments as well as the stock market that continues to react to all these developments. We want to now take you, though, to Carl Goldman and welcome him home. My goodness, you have been on a long road. You were back home in Los Angeles, but you spent a long time in Omaha, Nebraska, recovering from coronavirus. How are you feeling? I'm feeling awesome. It is so good to be home and back here in California. But uh, I must say the folks in Omaha were just fantastic. If I had to be anywhere recovering from the coronavirus, it would have been at Nebraska Medicine. They were just terrific. Okay, so I've been following your story and as you've been documenting it so well, but to give people a thumbnail of your month in quarantine that started from, you know, this these first symptoms, your eight hour fever, your two week cough. Tell me how you think you contracted coronavirus to begin with. Yeah, I was on the Diamond Princess taking a cruise with my wife and friends. And the Diamond Princess, as you know, was really the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak away from China, where now over 705 of us have the uh, virus, Nine, uh, seven people have died from the virus. I was on my way back to the States on a 737 cargo plane, feeling fine, took a nap. Two hours later, woke up with 103 fever, and they put me in a quarantine area on the plane. Unlike a cold or the flu, I didn't have any headache. There were no body aches. There were no sore throat, no sneezing, no sniffles, just that high fever. And then for me, I had a dry cough, as you said, that remained for about two weeks afterwards. It seemed like right your now, biggest though, problem, fine. Carl, though, your biggest problem is that you just kept testing positive for coronavirus even after you felt better. I mean, how many tests did you take and how many times, uh, you know, did the doctor leave your little post-it note saying uh, it's still a positive test? Yeah, I've been kidding about that post-it note. I've been writing a, a daily journal on our website, hometownstation.com, outlining just what each day was like. I was with the virus for 29 days. Now the record is 37. That's the longest anyone's had it on record. So I didn't quite make that record and actually I'm thankful I didn't. But they tested me uh, every other day, sticking two swabs deep up my nostrils, one down the throat. That in itself is not a fun process. I had also signed up for a clinical study that they're still doing right now, researchers on me as as a follow-up, taking many blood samples, testing my uh, swab and swabbing uh, everything I touched. And then more importantly, they did two bonus swabs, one under each eyelid and one deep up my rear end. So I was taking one for the team there. Yeah, do you, do you know though, did, in the information of what they were telling you about your case and how it compared to other cases, you know, why it stuck with you for so long or how typical it was. I mean, I'm sure I saw the room that you were kind of stuck in with with all your Gatorade and, and you're sitting there trying to figure out, you know, what it is about it, it staying in your system. Did you get any clarity? Or are you just sitting there waiting to be able to, to head home? I I missed part of that question because I would the uh, Skype dropped out. Yeah, it looks Can like we, we got, but in just in, in just terms of as you're sitting there, I mean, you were, you know, at, at ground zero with the health professionals trying to figure out and trying to, you know, you know what the testing feels like, you know what a clinical trial feels like. Did you get any clarity? I mean, did you leave there feeling 
uh, less sure and more nervous about those around you and, and where this pandemic is headed? Or did you get any kind of clarity and, and feeling like, you know what, uh, we're, we're getting a handle just em emotionally as you, it's, it's a long road you've been on. Yeah, and emotionally, I, I was taking things one day at a time, not worrying about the future, not dwelling on the past. And I think that's the best advice you can give. I was making lemons, finding the humor side to all this, along with, of course, the tragic side. My belief is that that um, we're going to get a handle on this virus very, very quickly. And while it will take a good 12, 18 months to, uh, until we have something that can actually stop the virus for everybody. I believe by now doing self-quarantines, some of the uh, issues that the government is doing right now of keeping all of us apart, that's the best thing that can happen for this country right now to still keep it contained while we're still in the early stages of an epidemic. Can I ask if you had any underlying conditions that would have made you more vulnerable? I mean, it, we're so glad that you're yeah. healthy and home. Yeah, I was, I'm 67 years old. I also have something called GBS, Ghislaine Barr syndrome, that affects my nerves and impacts my immune system as well. So they definitely wanted to put me into the biocontainment area to make sure that the uh, virus did not go into my lungs and, and create other problems, other challenges. Look, for 80% of the people out there, the virus is like a minor cold. I would have been at work a day later after my high fever had I not been contagious. So 80% of the people can feel good about this, even if they do get it. 20% are the ones that have to worry about it. Ones like me with a pre-existing condition or some of our very, very elderly out there are very vulnerable to it. And those 20% are seem to be having that move into their lungs and, and then it could turn into pneumonia. So that's where the challenge is. And that seems to be where most of the deaths are occurring as well. Carl, I wonder if you, I mean, you were on the cruise ship. You knew Corona was on the ship. You knew when you got a fever, when you're on a, a plane being, you know, flown out, that, that you were at risk. I wonder, do you think you would have taken the, taken the symptoms and that, that quick fever that you had and the cough that you had as seriously had you been home in Southern California, you know, going about your daily life, would you have taken those symptoms as seriously? Because that is a situation for a lot of people across the country when they're not sure if they're feeling bad or if, if they're, they don't automatically think corona in the way that you had more of a direct pathway to know that you were at risk for that. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, I do recommend everyone have a good digital thermometer at home because it's particularly as we get into allergy season right now with sniffles, coughs, and sneezes, you don't want to freak out if you think you have the virus, grab the thermometer because 99% of the cases I'm aware of, they all, the common denominator seems to be that high fever. Now, back when we were first on the Diamond Princess and they started to uh, quarantine us, that goes back to February 4th, there was still not that much information about the virus. China had been suppressing it and, and we were just learning about it on an hourly basis as the virus started spreading around the ship, we and, and the Diamond Princess back at the time, if you fit, if you go back to then, with the 705 people we have on board who came down with the virus, that represented double the population of the entire world minus China of those who had the virus back at that time. So, so many things to learn, Carl, from your experience. One, how fast it can spread. Two how the symptoms can be so different and and three that that you know you can get through it and so we are glad that you're home now back to your radio station back to your family and your wife who was uh, plugging away and, and in good health while you were gone and so welcome home to you thank you it's the simple things in life that you miss i never thought i'd miss cleaning up the dog poop but <laughs> I'm there now, all for it. Well, I'm sure your wife is glad that you, you missed cleaning that up so that job can be oh, all yeah. yours. All right. Thanks so much, Carl. All right. You are joining us now. If you are joining us now, uh, we want to remind you that this is the daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong, and we are live streaming for you every day on coronavirusnow.com. 
We start at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific time, and we try to bring you all the very latest information on the coronavirus outbreak nationwide. We want to talk about the stock market really quickly, and you can see the Dow is down over 9% right now. We should remind you that about 10 a.m. Pacific time this morning, the circuit breakers were triggered. That happens if there's a drop of more than 7%. They do that so that the momentum can kind of stop, so that whatever is sliding doesn't slide again. There are second circuit breakers that are kind of put it in place, so they are, will continue to watch uh, as the market uh, reacts to the coronavirus news nationwide. Uh, what happened is the market stopped for 15 minutes and then it restarted again. Although again, as you can see, we are seeing the Dow down nine and a half percent. The S&P is also down about eight percent this morning. So the markets are struggling a little bit this morning. Uh, the Dow tumbled 2300 points. We are just learning as well that oil has fallen 24 percent in the third worst day on record. It's an 18 year low. This is the fourth time those circuit breakers were kind of triggered at, um, uh, you know, on the stock market. So that is something that we continue to watch for you now. Uh, we are also uh, getting a uh, breaking news alert from the U.S. Census Bureau. The census is something we've been talking about. They're about to roll out and do this count that they do every 10 years. The AP is now reporting that the U.S. Census Bureau has announced that it is suspending all field operations until early April because of coronavirus concerns. That is big news. What usually happens is you should have been getting uh, your census information in your mailbox. Then what happens is that they give you the option to do it online, but you can fill this out. And so usually people are knocking on your door saying, hey, we're here reminding you to be counted for the census because that determines how a lot of federal funding gets distributed. Right now, the Census Bureau is saying we're going to take all the field operations out until early April. It is unclear how that is going to affect overall how the census is taken. We know the census is very important, but obviously the coronavirus is really turning everything on its head right now. So we'll continue to watch that. But that is the latest breaking news from the U.S. Census Bureau. All right, we have been taking your questions during this uh, live update for you. We've got Dr. Noelle Reed. We're going to bring her back in from Trinity Health and Wellness because we have more viewer questions. People have been able to give these questions on our Facebook live stream. They just write them in comments and we are able to see them. So let's get right to them so we can make sure we get them to the answers that they're looking for. Uh, the first question, Dr. Reed, can COVID-19 mm -hmm. be spread by someone touching groceries and delivered to my house? That's a good question because a lot of people yeah. who are in shelter in place, they're saying, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to go to the grocery store. Let's get the delivery to my house, but now are you yeah. at risk? Well, I think that we have to be cautious with all surfaces. So we don't really know at this point how long the virus stays viable on surfaces. The, the guesstimate is maybe a couple of hours, um, but we don't have a lot of data in regards to what the exact time is. So I think that what's important is that any time that you touch a surface, certainly if there's been some other human contact, you wash your hands, and that's really the best way to prevent um, transmission. So put your food away, wash your hands. If you take it back out again, you're about to start cooking, wash your hands. I mean, that seems to be... Wash, the, the wash just your hands, wash, wash your hands. hands, wash your hands. Yes. <laughs> and right. be efficient, you know, with the washing of the hands. 20 seconds, happy birthday, yes. Tw 20 <laughs> seconds, happy birthday times two. Okay, can I be tested for coronavirus if I don't have a fever but still feel sick? I mean, this is a question. I think everyone yeah. kind of wants to be tested because they want to know definitively that they have it, they don't have it because that calms fears, but there's not enough tests right now to go around for everyone. So what if they have a fever but they don't have anything else? We just heard from Carl Goldman, who was on the uh, Diamond Princess. He had a fever mm -hmm. for eight hours. Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and I have to say that, you know, as a clinician, a primary care provider inundated with calls, you know, people just very concerned because, you know, it's so unclear in terms of, you know, who should be tested and who not and uh, really limited test and having to make that decision on who gets tested. So I think it's really multifactorial. So, you know, if you have a fever and no other symptoms, think we would need to know, you know, what are your other contacts? What is the possibility that you may have come across someone who tested positive? What has been your recent travel? 
Are you a healthcare worker? Do you work with an elderly population? You know, these are all the things that will come into play in terms of who gets the test and who doesn't. And unfortunately, as it stands right now, we're still rather limited. Yeah, it's important to keep in mind it's more than symptom related. It's contact related. It's a lot of environment related. Yeah. Okay, you talked about staying away from your pets at home if you weren't mm -hmm. feeling well. That's that's certainly going to be difficult for people. Then the other question that we're getting from a viewer is: Can farm animals that are used for meat, like chickens and cows, catch COVID-19? You talk about where mm -hmm. this virus and how it's spread and people concerned about what they're eating as well. Mm -hmm. So as far as we know, uh, the, it, it should n not be transmitted through the food that we're eating. Now, if you're around those other van animals, you know, we're unclear in terms of what the transmission would be in that regard, direct contact. But eating the, the uh, food um, should not be uh, an issue at this time as we know it. Okay, let's talk about these shelter in places. We're seeing them in California. We are seeing them in other states. But a lot of people are trying to figure out if this all makes sense. The next question is about public transit. They're saying if it's still running with lots of people on it, what's the point of isolating at home? And I think this is where people are confused about trying to self isolate, socially distance, mm -hmm. and then watching people get on planes, trains, and in automobiles trying to figure out mm -hmm. if all of this makes sense in their heads. Yeah, and that's an excellent question. And I think that's why, you know, it's been recommended that you do just stay put, you know, as much as you can. And any non-essential travel should not be done at this time. Now, in regards to the uh, public transportation, um, you know, we are where we are at this point. And as as it stands now, we are not being asked to um, to quarantine across the board, but, you know, Life still goes on and people need to get to and from work. So, you know, we do the best that we can. So if you are someone who has to travel on public transportation, you know, try to distance yourself as much as you can. That's six feet of distance, um, if possible, and making sure that, you know, if you have the opportunity, wipe down the surfaces or in the, the areas that are that you will be touching and wash your hands consistently, carry hand sanitizer with you that has at least 60% alcohol or higher. And at this point, you know, that's really the best that we can do. And I think I think a lot of people have said too that if more people isolate at home, then the trains are emptier, public transit is exactly. emptier, and it's easier to also take the space if you need the space. Okay, we've talked a lot about masks and gloves. We reiterate that the government says do not buy masks because they health professionals need it. Um, that's certainly been a, a big topic of conversation. But what if you have a compromised immune system? So what if you mm -hmm. have asthma or you have a respiratory problem? And you have to go outside of your home. You have to maybe get on, mm -hmm. on, go to work or go to the grocery store. Should you wear a mask and gloves? Well, here again, um, I don't think that, it, that there's a, a, a straight answer in regards to that because the concern would be contamination. So if you are wearing a mask and you're not symptomatic, so you have asthma, but you're not symptomatic. So you're not, you're not wheezing, you're not short of breath um, and you wear a mask, you're touching things, right? You're, t you're touching surfaces that could be contaminated and then you touch the mask. So when you touch the mask, then the pathogens are likely to be directly against the areas that we don't want them, the nose and the mouth. So I would say, you know, even with having those conditions, um, if you're not having symptoms, it probably would not be the best approach to do that. Yeah, it, it, it's so hard. It's a, and we touch our face more than we know. I mean, certainly we have seen we that been proven over and over again. Okay, people are going to, mm -hmm. you know, their pharmacies and they're trying to buy this over the counter medicine that has always worked in the past for them. Zycam being one of them. That may lead to our next question. Does Zycam mm -hmm. work for coronavirus? It says it fights off 99% of viruses and wondering if it will work. What about Zycam? What about elderberry? What about airborne and uh, emergency and all those things that we like to stock yeah. because they make us feel like at least we're kind of building up the arsenal. Is that having right. any effect in helping us? As far as we know, there is no direct uh, treatment for COVID-19. Um, the Zycam, you know, is a, if, for those who don't know, is an over-the-counter medicine. It's intranasal, so you put it in your nose. It's a zinc-containing uh, medicine that is used typically when people have, when, when they have colds to shorten the course. It's not an antiviral. So it will likely not work against COVID-19. So I would not recommend using Zycam as a means of treatment. I have gotten actually a number of questions from different patients in terms of, you know, elderberry or high dose vitamin C or, you know, taking supplements and things of that nature. I think that, you know, anything that you can do to boost your immune system is fine. So if that makes you feel better in terms of, 
you know, yes, take your vitamin C, take your multivitamin, um, plus or minus the elderberry, but I would not see that as a means of treatment. So if you're looking at it in that regard, that would be the, the, the wrong approach. But yes, it is, it is it's fine to take mood, uh, immune boosters, but not to use it as a, as a mean for direct treatment for COVID-19. Yeah, it, it couldn't hurt you, but it may not help in this help fight you. against coronavirus. Exactly. Yes. What about cold weather? We've heard all this stuff about hot weather, cold weather, you know, and, and coronavirus. You know, people were looking to the summer. Obviously, none of that, you know, science Scientists have said that hasn't been proven. It would be nice if we could have some yeah. kind of definitive, you know, method. But the, point. the cold weather question yeah. is, you know, we're in the middle of, of winter and it's cold in lots of places. Right. So as far as we know, temperature does not necessarily have an impact on, on the virus um, as, as far as we know now. Um, will this be a seasonal um, um, epidemic? We don't know that at this point, you know, it's only, you know, time will show us, but also understanding too that, you know, the, the seasons change um, differently in different parts of the world. So as we transition into summer, it, it'll be a different climate somewhere else. So um, I don't foresee that, you know, necessarily getting to summertime that that will definitely be an end point for us. All it's right. hopeful and great <laughs> if that happens, but we can't really say that that will. Yes, and we can hope, but we have to be prepared for, for anything. All right, Dr. Noel Reed with Trinity yeah. Health and Wellness, thanks again for all those great answers. We appreciate it as those viewers keep giving us uh, more questions about how to deal with coronavirus. All right, let's give you the latest numbers uh, as, as we wrap up some of our coverage here. Fox has been tracking those numbers, so here are the latest numbers for you. We do have confirmed coronavirus cases in all 50 states in the U.S. We have more than 6,400 cases recorded, at least 114 deaths. When you take a look at who has the most cases, it is going to be New York. They're actually up from 967 cases yesterday. They now have 1,708. That is a 76.6% increase. So obviously a lot of concern there. The president said a Navy hospital ship is heading to New York to help with the response there. Washington, California, Massachusetts, New Jersey also have a large number of cases. Let's take a look at the stock market as well. We know the breakers went into effect this morning when the S&P dropped 7%. You can see the Dow is still down almost 9.5% right now. The S&P is also down about 8.5%. So it has been a tough day on Wall Street. Those breakers uh, going into effect for the fourth time in a month. So certainly the markets are something that we're going to keep in a close eye on all day long. All right, that is going to do it for this broadcast, but this stream will continue from Phoenix, Arizona. That's where folks at Fox 10 Phoenix will be bringing you the latest live pictures and news conferences from all over the country. And of course, you can visit coronavirusnow.com for the latest news in your area and beyond. I'm Claudine Wong, and we'll see you again tomorrow.